Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Let, Let us worship God. Let us confess our sins to God, trusting that God's steadfast love endures forever. Let us pray. God of heaven and earth, we give you thanks for sending us Jesus Christ in your name. Even though we profess to follow him, we confess that in times of trial, we too often deny him. Forgive us and heal us, we pray. Help us to put our faith not in the princes of the world, but only in the Prince of Peace. In Jesus' name, amen. It is the Lord who helps us. Who will declare us guilty? Because of the grace we received in baptism, we have nothing to fear. Forgiven and freed, let us share the peace of Christ with one another. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you.
You may be seated. It's time for the children's sermon. If any children would like to be sermonized. No, really, it's not optional. Come on down here. <laughs> I shouldn't even give you the option. Sorry about that. Hey, I'm glad you're bringing your palm branches. You'll, you'll want to do that. So go ahead and sit right down here. Sit, actually sit where you can see the screen, okay? Because, yeah, that's good. Sit right there. That'll do. All right, so, okay, fine. So um, normally I would tell you about how awesome and amazing today is. Today is Palm Sunday in the church, which I bet you figured out because you got palm branches, right? But I'm going to let this YouTube video show you what Palm Sunday is all about. So go ahead and... God's story, Palm Sunday. So part of God's story happened on a day we call Palm Sunday, and it begins like this. Remember how God sent his son Jesus to rescue us? Well, not everybody believed that Jesus was really God's son and the rescuer. But the ones who did believe in him did something pretty cool on Palm Sunday. It started just like any other day for Jesus. He was heading into Jerusalem with his disciples. But before they got there, Jesus did something surprising. He stopped and sent two of his disciples to go get a young donkey from a nearby village. He even told them exactly where the owner had last tied it up. They weren't sure why he needed the donkey, but they obeyed him. Kids, would you be willing to obey Jesus even if he asked you to do something you didn't understand? Anyway, when the disciples got back with the donkey, they threw their coats on its back like a saddle and Jesus climbed up. Pretty soon, the disciples saw why Jesus needed it. See, crowds of people came to the road and started laying coats and tree branches to make a path for Jesus. When this happened, many people recognized that Jesus was a king. Only kings came into a city like this. So Jesus rode the donkey like he was a one-man parade. And the crowds praised Jesus by yelling things like, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, and peace in heaven and glory in the highest, because they believed Jesus was the rescuer. But remember how some people didn't believe Jesus was God's son? Well, they told Jesus to make everybody stop yelling. They didn't think Jesus deserved to be treated like a king. You know what Jesus said? He told them, if they keep quiet, the rocks will cry out. Well, the people who didn't believe in Jesus didn't like thinking about people or rocks praising him. And that made Jesus sad. He actually started crying. And not just crying, weeping. Here, the people were standing next to the rescuer they'd been wanting and waiting for their whole lives. And they were missing it. But even though Jesus cried, Palm Sunday isn't a sad story. Easter is all about Jesus' amazing rescue, and Palm Sunday is a reminder of just how special that rescue is, and how much Jesus loves everyone. And that's the story of Palm Sunday. So in case you missed it, here's the quick version. Jesus was traveling. He sent his disciples to get a donkey. People spread coats and branches on the road. They praised Jesus. Some people didn't recognize that he was the king. That made Jesus sad. He had come to rescue them. A few days later, he would show just how much he loves us. And that's a part of God's story. All right, so that was pretty cool, wasn't it? That little video. Um, so we are at the start of, like, this is the biggest week in, in the church. Um, like Christmas is a big deal, right? Christmas is a really big deal, but this is an even bigger deal because we have today, which is Palm Sunday, and we're gonna get back together again on Thursday for another worship service, when we have the Last Supper. And then uh, Good Friday is the day that we will remember that Jesus died on the cross, and then it'll bring us to Easter Sunday, which we celebrate like the biggest the biggest thing that we have because we celebrate new life and, and all that kind of exciting thing. We'll also hopefully have those caterpillars turn to butterflies schedule at all, uh, that, that should happen. So, so I, I just wanted to let you know, wanted, wanted to show you why we have these, these palms. Please take these home with you if you want to. If you don't want to, you know what we'll do? We'll make them into ashes for your next time. So either way it works. Okay? All right. Thanks. Head on back.
note it's not printed in your bulletin. That means you have to reach down and get one of the Red Pew Bibles, and if you open it right smack to the middle, you're going to be very, very close to solve 118. We're going to do uh, the, it's on pages 565 and 566 of the Old Testament part. <coughs> Hear the word of the Lord. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. And then skipping down to verse 19. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His, for his steadfast love endures forever. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. All glory, Lord, and honor to thee, Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children all sing. They sing. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The company of angels praising him on high, and we with all creation reply, reply. Hosanna, Hosanna, the little children sang. Hosanna, Hosanna, the lovely anthem rang. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. All glory, Lord, and honor to thee, Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children all sing. They sing. Hosanna, Lord, Hosanna, the little children. Oh, his 
Before we get started, just a reminder, um, there are large print Bibles and large print hymnals available uh, as you come in. And those of you who are at Zoom, Zoom, um, you can ask us and we will send you copies of those as well. Our uh, New Testament passage, our gospel passage from the gospel according to Luke chapter 19 verses 28 through 40 is the text for our sermon this morning. And it is on page 83 of the New Testament. So I would invite you to read along or to hear the word of God. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. The word of the Lord. If you've been paying attention at all during the last, oh, 125 sermons or so that I've shared with you, then you will not be surprised when I say this morning that the Bible is full of surprises. Take our account of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem from Luke, for instance. Now, first of all, if it weren't for the editors of our Pew Bible, the words triumphal entry would not appear on these pages. That's an addition by the editors. Nor do the words Holy Week or even Palm Sunday. In fact, if you've had your morning cup of coffee and are feeling particularly astute this morning, you'll have noticed there is no mention of palms in Luke's version of the story. Lots of cloaks, one colt, no palm branches anywhere. Just like Christmas and Easter, our understanding of what happened when Jesus entered Jerusalem for the last time is a mashup of all the gospel accounts. The other gospels mention the palms, but not Luke. Everybody mentions a colt, but it's Mark that distinctly says that it's a donkey's colt. Matthew says it's a colt and its mother that Jesus rides. John chronicles Jesus' entry into Jerusalem immediately after he raises Lazarus from death. Luke does not. Luke shows that Jesus has been inexorably journeying towards Jerusalem. But it is a series of teachings and healings that come before the triumphal entry, not the Lazarus miracle. And I should also mention, I, I wonder if you caught this, that uniquely to Luke, the disciples set Jesus on the colt. That video showed him jumping on like he was a a cowboy from the Wild West. But Luke says the disciples set him on the colt. So why is all of this important? Uh, to be perfectly frank with you, it just may be more interesting than important per se, but it is a helpful lesson on the wisdom of not filling in, not filling in details that aren't necessarily there. I read a great commentary on this passage this morning. Uh, by Emerson Powery, 
a professor of biblical literature at Messiah College in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. And Dr. Powery looked at the text and not surprisingly, he looked at it in terms of power. The fact that Jesus decided to ride into Jerusalem on a colt at the beginning of the Passover festival had plenty of symbolic meaning and power. It was designed to remind everyone of a king's entrance. It certainly was a Roman custom for a general who had just won an important battle to throw a parade in Rome in his own honor. This meant great riches and honor for his family, and more often than not, it signaled his desire to become the next emperor. But the disciples and the visitors to Jerusalem didn't miss the symbolism either. In Matthew's account, Jesus fulfills an Old Testament prophecy. Tell the daughter of Zion, look, the king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, if we jump back to Luke's account, Luke says the whole multitude of the disciples began to shout, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Peace and glory in heaven. Peace and glory in heaven. Where have we heard those words before? Well, back in Luke chapter 2, verses 14. To be exact, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. Who said that? Just a multitude of the heavenly host announcing Jesus' birth not so long ago and not so far away. Are you surprised yet? So there's all this symbolic power on display as Jesus rides this cult through the streets of Jerusalem. A new king is here. The long-awaited Messiah has come. But Professor Powery, who does so sound like a character from Clue, points out that even though the gospel writers use words like multitude and crowds, it may be that the triumphal entry wasn't quite as triumphant as we've pictured it all these years. We have to read between the lines a little bit, but think about it for just a minute. The Romans, who are in charge, it's a military occupation of the Roman army, the Romans knew a coup when they saw one. I've already told you, by this time it was a long established tradition back in Rome. But in none of the gospel accounts is there any mention that the Romans were in the least bit concerned that a new king of the Jews had just entered the south gate of town. Are there some Pharisees there who are worried about what's unfolding? Absolutely, yes, there are. But where are the military police? Where are the troops that had one job, make sure that nobody challenges Roman rule? They are conspicuously absent from the gospel accounts. Later in the week, the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, does not seem to know anything about Jesus beyond what the temple authorities tell him. Jesus may not have been front page news in Jerusalem after all. And so, what happens if we imagine not a huge Macy's Thanksgiving style parade for Jesus' entry, but instead a humbler affair with maybe dozens of folks laying down their cloaks and declaring that Jesus, the rabbi from Nazareth, may be much more than just a rabbi from Nazareth. It's like Godspell, the musical. The cast is just Jesus and the 12 disciples. And that is much more than enough to tell the gospel story with power and beauty and a touch of humor to boot. 
It is one of the great reoccurring themes of Luke and the other gospel writers that the people who should have recognized who Jesus was, son of man and son of God, were so much more clueless than Professor Powery with the pipe in the parlor. It's almost amazing to think it's almost even more amazing to think of Jesus' ministry as the mustard seed that has now grown into a world religion. In any case, surprises or not, we are at the beginning of Holy Week. A lot is about to happen between now and Easter Sunday. Jesus will keep teaching and healing. He will go into the temple and turn over the tables and drive the money changers out. He'll celebrate the Passover meal with his disciples. He will wash their feet as a servant would, even though he was their Lord and master. He will be betrayed into the hands of the temple authorities who will mock him and convict him and send him to Pilate. Jesus will be tortured and crucified and will die on the cross and he will be placed in a tomb, and heaven and earth will hold their breath. No, no matter how big or small the triumphant entry actually was, we Christians believe that it has cosmic importance. The die has been cast, the Rubicon has been crossed, there is no turning back now. God's will shall be done. We, disciples of a later time and distant place, we will gather again soon. We will remember that last supper that Jesus shared with his closest disciples. We will look to the terrible darkness of Good Friday. And to absolutely no one's surprise, we will, at least symbolically, also hold our breath until the first light of Easter. Amen. Let us say what we believe using the brief statement of faith, section one. That can be found on page 37 of your blue hymnal, and that's right in the front. Please stand. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom we alone worship and adore.
Good morning. Good morning. What does July 16th mean to you? If you are part of the Navajo Nation or have connections near Church Rock, New Mexico, that date stirs a heartbreaking memory of a preventable disaster that continues to have disastrous impacts. Over 40 years ago, the earthen dam of a nuclear waste disposal pond broke near Church Rock and dumped tons of solid radioactive waste and 90 million gallons of acidic and radioactive liquids into the Rio Paroco. This resulting contamination of land, air and ground water affected nine Navajo municipalities. The toxic cumulative effects of this human caused disaster have impacted the Navajo people for generations, especially in the form of such chronic health problems as asthma, as well as higher incidence of miscarriages, birth defects, liver and pancreatic cancer. Each year, hundreds of dying families and their allies come together near the tragic anniversary to pray, to heal, and to act together. One great hour of sharing connects us with these families through MAZE, Multicultural Alliance for a Safe Environment. MAZE's mission envisions respectful, peaceful communities cherishing a healthy environment. I like to think that's a lot like our church's mission too. It's part of what led the Committee on Self-Development of People to connect with MAZE, reaching out like the arms of the church, as Dr. Reverend Johnson with SDOP puts it, to address the systems and structures that perpetuate oppression leading to poverty. Susan Gordon, Bayes' coordinator, reminds us that she, this is not a short-term work. This is decades and generations. Taking the long view has not prevented progress. The community took a very strong stand opposing new uranium mines on the Navajo Nation and were instrumental in getting Navajo Nation to pass two fundamental laws. One prohibits new uranium mining, another prohibits transporting radioactive materials across the nation. Uranium Legacy Actions and Remembrance Day, July 16th, connects the importance of lament, especially in the face of intergenerational trauma, with the opportunity to educate and expose Navajo youth to the realities of environmental racism. Today, I'm grateful for thy neighbors Gordon and Johnson for this church, the whole church together, for reminding us that this day and every day are part of the decades and generations where we seek change. Our gifts to one great hour of sharing connect us with people finding their voice and assessing their God-given power and the single largest way that Presbyterians come together to work for a better world by advocating the causes of justice, resilience, and sustainability. During Lent, we celebrate that God connects us through Jesus' resurrection and connects us with those who have the least. That's how Matthew 25 puts it, and that's what one great hour of sharing is all about. Thank you for your generosity, and as we always say, when we all do a little, it adds up to a lot. God has given us his only child, Jesus Christ, as the way of our salvation. So let us give generously as God has given to us.
Holy One, we give you thanks for the great deeds of salvation that you have done and continue to do. Bless these offerings of thanksgiving that they may further your kingdom in this world. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. God inspires us to pray, hears our prayers, and answers our prayers. Let us pray. God of grace and God of glory, we thank you that you are with us, that you inspire us to worship you, that you move through your Holy Spirit so that we may hear the word read, the word proclaimed, that we may sing our praises, that we may celebrate your entry into Jerusalem in the beginning of this holy week that leads through Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and the resurrection of Easter morning. We've lifted up earlier our joys, our concerns, there's so much more in the world to be joyful and concerned about. And yet we know that nothing passes your notice. That you understand all. And that you love all and wish good for all and blessings for all. Help us to be instruments of your peace in this world. To do the work that you have charged us to do. We take time now to silence our lips, but to open our hearts and our spirits. And so we ask, Lord, please hear the prayers of the people. Let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 729, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. Once again, if you're comfortably able, will you please stand and let us sing together.
was asked to receive your blessing. I encourage you to sit and listen to the postlude. And then to join us for Faith Dialogues, which I believe we'll be able to do like right at 11 today. So, once again, my friends, may the love and peace of God be with you, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.